For the month of June, Emily and I have decided to donate 100% of the profits that we make from our discount code CANDY at adamandeve.com to the Black Sex Worker Collective. If you guys want to donate directly to the Black Sex Worker Collective, we have links to their website in our bios on Twitter at Candy Girl Pod and on Instagram at Candy Girl Podcast. So if you go over to adamandeve.com and you use discount code CANDY, C-A-N-D-Y, at checkout, you'll get 50% off an item plus 10 free gifts, free shipping, and you'll be helping out black sex workers. Again, that's discount code CANDY, C-A-N-D-Y. Thanks, guys. Welcome to another episode of Candy Girl. I'm your host, Shelby. And I'm your co-host, Emily. And today we're interviewing Miss Natalie King. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Mistress Natalie, and I have been a New York City pro dom for over 25 years. Which is really exciting. So we're super excited to have you on the show. Tell us a little bit how you got into dom work. Honestly, I fell into it by accident. It was back in 1993. So this was well before the internet or anything uh, of that nature. And uh, a friend of mine who I knew from high school, I saw her on the subway my first semester home from college. And I was, you know, I was coming home on the weekend. I saw her on the train. It's like, oh, hey, let's catch up. And she's like, well, I'm on my way to work, but you can come with me. I was like, okay, cool. You know, you're like 18. You don't think to ask, like, where do you work or what's going on? So um, we get off in the West Village, and she brings me to this um, brownstone right next to the Blue Note Jazz Club. And I go inside this house, and again, don't think of anything. I'm just, like, catching up with my friends, and we're hanging out in the basement of some brownstone and, you know, whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, like, these two other women come down, and this, like, older woman comes down, and everybody's, like, all sort of, like, talking and, you know, rushing around. And I'm, like, ask my friend, uh, I was, like, what do you do? Like, what what is this place? Um, And she's, like, it's a role play house. And I was, like, a what? I had no idea. I was, like, what the F is this? And so, obviously, you know, it was, like, sort of time for them to work, so I didn't have time for my 20 questions, but I watched everything that was going on, and I remember that these bunk beds, and I just, like, plopped myself over out of the way, and the, the woman, the older woman, would, like, she opened up this trunk um, that had all these, like, clothes and costumes in it, and she's, like, reading the script, and the women are all getting dressed and ready, and then they go upstairs. It was, like, a three-story brownstone, four stories with the basement. And, you know, it was, it was a client. So my friend did not get picked for the session. So she came back downstairs and, you know, that's the 20 questions. Like, what is this? <laughs> and honestly, I was just fascinated. I was completely and totally fascinated by everything that was going on. And I still didn't really quite understand exactly what it was, but I knew enough, you know, to kind of, get get the the hint that something pretty kinky was was going on and I literally came home every weekend from school I had no Friday classes and I would take the bus down and I would just hang out with my friend and that the hanging out uh eventually turned into me getting dragged into the room (laughs) because she's like the woman of course sort of sees me and is like work for me, work for me, and and other than my friend, everybody else um, was much older. Like, the women, I think the next youngest in age was probably about 35 or so. So she sees young girl, this, that, you know, dollar signs. Fair enough. (laughs) And, um, but I I really was like, no, no, this is not something I could do. I was very shy, I was very introverted. Um, And growing up, I was very, very overweight. Like, I was 240 pounds by the time I was 13. So I'd lost some weight, but I was still really overweight. I was super shy. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. This is, this is not for me. Um, and then one day, my friend just kind of dragged me in the room. She's like, I'm going to lose the client if you don't come in. He wants two young girls. Please, 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 please. So I go into the room, and honestly, I don't really remember what happened. But I remember leaving. 
and my friend saying, how did you know to do that? She's like, I've been doing this for a year. How did you know to do that? And I was like, oh. <laughs> and that was my first experience. That, that was basically it. It was just accident after accident after accident. <laughs> so it came very naturally to you then. You know, um, uh, especially because I got my start, and it was more of a role play house. We did a lot of BDSM, but it was very mild. So it wasn't a dungeon setting. There was pillars and stuff for bondage and tables for bondage, but it was not this heavy BDSM. So it was much more about role play and fantasy, so like adult play acting. And I loved to act when I was younger. So for me, that was very natural. You know, people would come in, uh, and the woman who, who ran the place really would try and extract from them, like, some sort of fantasy, whether they had one or not. So that actually did come very, very natural to me. And also, honestly, ever since I was very young, I know I had, like, a kinky side to me, even though I didn't know what it was. Um, when I was, like, 13, I saw a Robert Maplethorpe coffee table book that my father had he was an amateur photographer and he had this and there's a self-portrait of him with like a bull whip up his ass and he's looking through his legs he's got a porter cap on and I just remember being captivated by this at like 13 and MTV had like Motley Crue and all this sort of these videos with these women and the guys in leather with chains and I had no idea it had like sexual connotations, but I know I was very drawn to the aesthetic of it. And it's kind of like you weren't supposed to do that stuff, you know? There, there was no acceptance of it back then. There was no dictionary of what it was. And I just knew that I liked that you weren't supposed to do it and that it wasn't what everybody else was doing because growing up, being the kind of person that never fit in, you know, when back in the... 90s, very, very few people in 80s were that overweight when they were young, thankfully. But, um, you know, I was never going to fit in. I was never going to be one of the popular kids. It was never going to be something I was going to do. So I just said at a really young age, I'm going to do the exact opposite of everything you're supposed to do. Like, whatever you're supposed to do to be popular, I'm going to do the exact opposite of that because they're never going to like me anyway, so F you. (laughs) And so this was just literally right in the vein of everything I had been doing up until up until that point of like a major just like I'm not supposed to do this I'm totally doing this <laughs> you have a very edgy style so I I definitely see what you mean by that you know yeah when I, I mean I started dyeing my hair crazy colors literally when I was 13 like shaving my head and and you know I pierced like my own belly button when I was very young I got my first I got my first tattoo when I was 13 no this is, way I, this is when tattooing was illegal in New York by the way so tattooing was illegal in New York and um my friend's friend wants to be a tattoo artist and he was only 16 and he lived in one room in this, like, um, Asian family's house. And he was this uh, Spanish kid in the really kind of sketchy neighborhood in Queens. And she's like, oh, we should go hang out here. And he had an autoclave and some tattoo magazines. And I was like, sign me up. And I, it was the third tattoo he ever did. Two were on himself. <laughs> oh, my but wait, God. Do you, do you still have it? Do. <laughs> I mean, you can't really see it at this point too much because it's it's pretty, like, blown out, and it was small. But it was, like, maybe that big, and it was, like, a little dragon. And it's, like, right back here. Um, and so I still have it. I never got rid of it. And, um, yeah, so I had that when I was 13. And Did you ever go through a phase in your life where you regretted it? It seems like now it's, like, a fun thing to have. Okay. No, the only time that I really regretted, or the only tattoo that I really regretted is I got, like, this, like, tribal rose when I was 18, because my brother-in-law was like, I'm going to take you to my tattoo artist. Again, it still was not legal. And the first one I had, I got to just pick something, and he drew it. When I went, I was so excited, so excited. And I got there, and the guy's like, oh, well, you know, you can only pick what's on the wall. Like, they didn't, oh, (laughs) like, what? And so I just picked anything, because I wanted to get it. So that was really my only only mistake of a tattoo. And then when piercings and tattoos started to get very, very popular, 
um, I kind of started to regret it a little bit. And that's when I took out a lot of my piercings just because it was becoming mainstream. So I no longer had any really interest in it because I was like, everybody's doing this. And so I, I, I just stopped for a while. I had gotten dermal implants um, before they came out. So that was something I did. And um, then like actually a few years ago, I pierced my nose. So that, that was just because I was kind of jealous. I, I pierced my client's nose or I had somebody come in and do it. And I was like, I want that. <laughs> so I just decided to Wait, do it. Wait, what's this during a session? Yes, it was part of our, part of our session. Um, I've had several clients get uh, piercings during session. Now I do temporary ones. So if you want your nipples pierced or if you want like a belly button or a, a temporary like scrotal piercing or something like that, like I'll totally do that in session. But if you want a permanent one, I always feel it's best to have a professional come in just to make sure it's perfect, especially since usually the permanent ones are like Prince Albert's and there's a lot of nerves um, in there. So, and they bleed a ton and I just want them to be able to confer with somebody who does that really professionally. So I have a friend of mine who comes in and she's given a couple of Prince Albert's, uh, a couple of, um, nipple piercings as well um wait what's yeah. a temporary nipple piercing so it's basically just doing a nipple piercing with either a needle and taking it out at the end of the session or doing it with jewelry but taking it out so you're putting it in and then taking it out so i have a lot of a lot of people that i see that i do piercings that are just for the time that we're together or possibly like a 24-hour period where they'll come out come out the next day like so I had one client and we had such a wonderful relationship he's like one of my most favorite people when we first started one of his hard limits was nipple play any kind of nipple play like couldn't touch them like you know after six years pierced his nipples and took him to yoga hot yoga right afterwards so we had the session and then he has to go to hot yoga and literally in the middle of yoga class blood started dripping through his shirt Oh my god! Oh my gosh! Wait, I was I was just I gonna like say droplets on his So was hot yoga part of the session too? Well, um, he and I are, are very, like I said, we became very very good friends as well. So okay, not technically part of the session, but I'll, I do a lot of kinky coaching, so. Um, having people do physical things combined with pink is like kind of my thing. So our plan for the evening was session, yoga, dinner, and then um, come back to me the next day to take out like the piercings and, and stuff like that. So that's really like the, the session actually finished like the next day. So it was like we did the corporal and all of that sort of stuff and then yoga, dinner, and then next day. That sounds really fun, actually. I cannot fathom getting your nipples pierced just to take it out later. Wait, the so Shelby and I, Shelby and I both had our nipples pierced, and I remember I got mine done at a sketchy place in LA, and when they put in the second one, it ended up being crooked because I passed out during it. Has that <laughs> happened before? It hurts so bad. <laughs> yeah, I think people pass out on I me, mean, not from piercings. Also, generally when I've done piercings, my clients are tied up, so they're usually horizontal, even though that's not the best way to do a nipple piercing, especially if you're a woman. If you're a man, you have a lot more latitude because they don't have the which ways. It kind of looks the same whether you're standing or laying. So it's a lot easier to pierce someone's nipples laying down. Um, but I have had clients pass out on me from other things. What, what happens when a client passes out? I... <laughs> I love how you're just like, oh, this is what it's not fun. I'll t I mean, it really depends one on the person and the situation and what what's going what's going on. You know, obviously, there's always that sense of like, oh my god, something's wrong. You know, because someone just passed out. Okay, so in a few situations, it actually was kind of sucky because the person actually got a little hurt. Like one person sprained an ankle, they were standing, and there was maybe six inches of give on their wrist restraints, and they literally went from being totally fine to passing out and kind of, I guess, landed funny on their on their ankle. So that was, that was not fun. I had another uh, person... 
uh, pass out and hit his head, which was the least fun of them all because um, I was very worried about a concussion. And that one I was actually really pissed about because I told him to stay where he was and he like beeline headed for the bathroom. And I was like, no, because I knew like the bathroom's the worst place to be. It's small, it's hard. If you would have just stayed on the carpet, everything would have been fine. But that's, what can you do? Then I had a very interesting pass out situation and I knew the guy was going to pass out. And of course he's not communicating clearly. It was hot. It was the summer. It was a lot of bondage. And I just looked at, and he was, you know, blindfolded and his, and I could just, I touched his neck and I felt like sweat, like real sweat. And I was like, and I lifted up the blindfold. I was like, are you okay? And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I put the blindfold back down fucking not two minutes later, pff, done. So <laughs> I get him down to the floor. He was pretty heavily restrained, but I wanted him horizontal. Thankfully, I kept his ankle shackled because it was someone I'd never seen before, okay? We had some interactions, but not in person. He comes to, he doesn't know where he is, and he doesn't know who I am. And so he was freaked out, and I was really freaked out because I was like, this guy's going to try and kill me. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was not good. And then after my heart rate went back down to, like, a normal, <laughs> like, you know, he kind of realized what was going on and all of that sort of stuff. But that was really scary for me because I was like, this dude is just pretending. He didn't really fucking pass out. He's going to kill me. Thank God he's strapped to the wall. <laughs> not good. Bro, I can't, I can't imagine, like, I'd be like, shit, what's my safe word? <laughs> yeah, and you know, uh, one person I was actually really pissed at, because he wants me to choke him out, but play, kind of thing, and I had him in a chokehold, and, um, you know, he's supposed to give me two taps when, if he thinks he's getting too lightheaded, and this is total toppling from the bottom, and I actually never saw him again because of this because we had communication issues before. And um, he just wanted to be pushed until he was really passed, until he really passed out. And so he just let me do my thing, and I totally choked him out. And all of a sudden, there's a guy convulsing with his eyes rolled back in his head in my arms. And he's like, Ugh. and I was like, great, I just, I just killed somebody. <laughs> and then I realized it, he just passed out, and it was like a weird angle, and his head was back, and his eyes were rolled back. So, you know, when he came to, he was super happy. And I was like, we're done. I was like, thank you, but no thank you. Because, you know, the position that he, that he was in, it kind of really hurt me because I was behind him choking him out. So if he really, if I wasn't, like, if I didn't have the bench behind me, he could have brought me down with him. I was in stilettos, you know. So that was, that was the one time. Everybody else was fine. That one, I was just like, no, because you completely went against our boundaries of what we set up of if you think you're getting there because afterwards I, I talked to him I was like what the hell happened and he's like I just really I wanted to go all the way men so it was it, so yes passing out vomiting vomiting has happened you know panic attacks oh gosh I, <laughs> Bro, I, I still can't imagine like coming to and being like where am I and then slowly being like oh that's right I love going to sex dungeons <laughs> like, <laughs> so okay uh, I, as I like I tend to like just write down questions as I kind of go so um, going to my next question is there a certain level of communication you require like is there yeah. some sort of vetting process what is it um you know it's really interesting because right now i mean it's developed over 20 some odd years and also the clients that i'm looking for now are very different than the clients i was looking for years ago because i've developed a certain preference in who i want to be playing with and luckily i've gotten to a point in my career where i can be a little bit more particular about who i want to see because, you know, my skill set is such that I think I should really only be aligned with people that I know that I will get along with. I don't want to waste their time or their money, number one. And I want to make sure that I'm going to be able to really deliver on whatever they, they need and whatever they're looking for by participating in these activities. 
so as far as coming to see, and it doesn't mean I have to see someone who has experience. People get really confused and they're like, oh, you've been doing this for so long. I don't want to see you because I'm a novice. That's not the case. Um, you know, it's just making sure I think that we will be able to, to really get to the same point that, you know, you want and I think would be best. Um, there's a submission form on my website, which is the way people start. So it's really, it's pretty simple. It's a couple of questions and that gives is, me a um, Is submission form a pun or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. I just. I used to call, I used to, years ago, like when I first started back in like, when I first had a profile, it was a profile form back in the day, like in 2000 when my first website first came out. But through the years of developing it, it is the submission form. I love it. <laughs> Got it. Let's, let's keep going. Um, so, yeah, so, so basically a submission form is filled out. I review it, contact them back, and then set up a time to speak on the phone and really go over details. I'm. Uh, it's very important for me to talk to, talk to whoever I'm going to see first. I know a lot of people, they just text or do things online only, but I really need to speak to a person and have a dialogue with them because there's so much that you can tell just in the – tone of their voice, hesitation in answering a question. You can really read a lot more about a person when, when you speak to them. So speaking is absolutely essential. Um, and then after that, if I think that it's something that it would be good for both of us, then you know we go forward and plan a session. You mentioned earlier when, so when your client had passed out and woke up and didn't really remember what was going on, you had mentioned like, oh my God, he's going to kill me. And like, obviously that was in good fun, but have, have you ever felt like unsafe in a situation? Cause I feel like you are bringing strangers into a secluded area with you. So that's gotta be a little bit nerve wracking. Yeah. You know, I have to say when I first started doing this, uh, especially like I said, back in the nineties, the um, early nineties and working in very sketchy, um, places for, for a while, yeah, no, I, there was a few instances where it was not good, you know, and there, there's no, I mean, nothing ever happened to me as far as like needed to really have any attention or care, but was the, the shit scared out of me. And if things didn't sort of play out positively, could really bad stuff have happened? Yeah, definitely. Um, I will say that nothing like that has even come close to happening in well over a decade, like 15 years or so. Honestly, the, the worst thing was that, that one that I talked about, the person passing out. That was probably the most scared I was in the past 15 years. Scared for, for my safety. Uh, then there was a, a time before that, I was a really good client who unfortunately got into drugs uh, during the time that I was seeing him and literally had like a psychotic break. And it's very interesting because like I knew he stuff was going bad, but I was still at a point in my career where, you know, um, needed to make money, needed to work, knew the client, felt it was an okay risk, sort of, kind of knew it probably wasn't the best idea, did it anyway, and he really did freak out. And I just, at this point in my life, would not make decisions like that. Like those risks, when I even get a hit, hint <laughs> that something might be slightly awry, um, I just, at, at my age and at, at being working on my own, I just won't take the risk anymore. Yeah, reasonable. And there's so much more vetting that you can do now and so many more resources that you have that I think it really prevents it. I mean, people used to stiff you steal from you like it was it was not cool back then and now it's one of those things where you get references you get people's social media like they understand you have a lot more information than a random person that you don't know calling from a payphone it's very different very different i mean now people can be tracked it's a, it's just it's apples apples and oranges compared to the way that it used to be so between my sort of level of safety that I put in myself and just things that you can find out about people for your own protection if necessary, you know, I, I feel a lot safer and have had, like I said, I've had no issues. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. I've had a few people stiff me in, in the past 15 years, a couple. Um, but again, that, those are those times where, so the, 
very, very well, but you know them enough to not say count a tribute in advance, et cetera, et cetera. And there's always, every once in a while, people surprise you and you get burnt no matter um, how good of a judge of character you are. That's interesting. Yeah. So clearly you've been doing this for a while. Um, I guess I kind of want to know, like, what trends have there been that change between decades? Like, similar to how, you know, we used to love having no eyebrows and now it's all about having the fullest eyebrows possible. Like, is there anything in the cape community that you've noticed has gone away or changed? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. So, <laughs> uh, and I don't know if this exists elsewhere. I, I don't think it is so much. I will say like years ago, because of the much, much, much more underground nature of it, there was a lot more kind of drugs and partying and stuff. Like we had so many clients who would come in in the nineties and it would be like, they'd be there for 10 hours, 12 hours, you know, and they just rotating girls and tons and tons of Coke and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And that, I mean, to my knowledge, granted, I'm not young anymore. <laughs> I'm not seeing clients that are doing that. And most of my clients have been with me forever. They're in their 60s. But to my knowledge, that really isn't the way of this anymore, which is great. It's, it's, it's definitely elevated um, the, the participation of it, and people are doing it for a, a lot better reasons. Um, also, one of the other things that I see is just from um, – a health standpoint because of our knowledge like years ago like it was not the cleanest of clean things you know and now everything is covered and and you know sterile and you know all of that so which is a, another wonderful thing that I'm seeing it's like wow people really have a much higher requirement for that client wise because clients years ago they they did not care at nearly nearly as much and as far as activities go, I, I will say it's a very interesting because I think a lot of social media playing into this, that people are asking for a lot more extreme things a lot sooner. Like, literally, I'm a novice and I want you to pierce my scrotum, you know, or, or what I get. It's like, and I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah, that's not happening right off the bat. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately I do see a lot of like, I want this really crazy intense stuff right away. Um, strap on is something that has always been around, but has sort of gone up and down and up and down, um, in its use because for, I know there were some instances in New York where people got arrested under sort of the, the strap on doing anal thing. So it's sort of been this peak and valley of, yes, it's okay to do it. No, it's okay. Yes, it's okay. And I think it trends with what people are showing. So when it's okay to do it, everyone's showing pictures of strap ons and this and that. So there's more requests and more compliance for it. Um, but when women are really holding back on showing that because they're worried, then it kind of dips a little bit. Are we at a peak right now? Because lately, one of my friends keeps talking about how badly he wants to get pegged. Yes, we are. We are. We are definitely in a very big upswing. Like the downswing was a couple of years ago, and now I think people are not caring so much. So when Snesta Fosta first sort of came out, there was a big like everybody is much more cautious and strap on was one of the things that people were being very, very cautious around, not wanting to put it on Twitter, not wanting to put it anywhere. But I think over the past year and a half or two years, as things have kind of, you know, not been as bad as people thought, as far as coming after you for activities. Um, I think that I'm seeing a trend of people really putting a lot more of that content back out publicly. So yes, I would definitely say we are, we are on an upswing. Also, I feel younger people are way more open to the idea of pegging because of the more social acceptance of the fact that, well, one, gender fluidity, but not so much putting your sex acts to your sexual orientation, whereas many generations before really saw that as it means that you're X, Y, and Z. It means you're gay. And if somebody wasn't gay, they, they had such a conflict of like, how do I do this and not be gay and what's going on and this and that. But I think because there's just so much 
more information now and people are just talking so much about things like this that there's a lot more curiosity with a lot less stigma, which is fantastic. Um, so that, that seems to be a trend. It's, it's interesting because I have a sort of, you know, particular niches. So people kind of seek me out for that. I don't know too much more what's going on in the outside world, um, other than my little bubble that I've created. Um, I, I will say also though, that back in the day, there was a lot more weird fetishes like very strange fetishes like people would get off on like just interesting bizarre kinky is stuff there, is there anything that's coming to mind right now oh my god so I had one guy who used to fill a pair of work boots with vaseline and like to step in and out of them okay that, that was that was one of his i had this other person who would bring the strangest things to have put in his butt he tried to bring a fish like a whole fish um <laughs> okay um yeah so it was just like really weird weird things and back then i mean it was just so so much different like some guy liked anal and i remember that you know i, I come up into the room to start the session and literally there was like this little pyrex type soft cornered but christmas tree thing that was out and he was like sitting on it because, you know, butt plugs were not, like, so accessible. <laughs> so to, to now, it's like we had the luxury $300 vibrators and everything's fancy and remote controls and sanitary and silicone. And then back in the day, we were using wooden spoons and rope for harnesses to strap on some old decrepit dildo. And people were sitting on Christmas trees because that's what we did. Bro, I guess I never really just sat and thought, like, people didn't just start putting things up their butt with the invention of the butt plug. Like, of course it's been going on for a long time. Of course it's... Yeah, like, they have all the fancy sounds for, like, catheter stimulations. No, back then it was, like, trying to stuff a uh, toothbrush. <laughs> you know, whatever you can find, chopstick. Oh, my God. So, um, what is your niche? <laughs> I know. Um, so, right now, there's a couple of areas that I really love to, to play in. One is the kinky coaching. So, because of my development over the years, my own personal interests in health and fitness, um, really finding ways to use BDSM and fetish to elevate a person sort of holistically, um, whether it's decompression, stress relief, you know, sort of pushing yourself physically so you get the same adrenaline and endorphin release, release as physical activities, um, goal setting, all of those things. Like if, if people have goals and they, they want some sort of accountability, that's my, my thing. I, I have a life coaching certification and I'm personal training certification. So combining the two is great because I love to see people happy and, you know, progress in life. And using kink is just one of the many ways that, that we can do it. Um, so that's one. Then feminization, medical play, and heavy sensory deprivation, I would say, are the other other areas that I really enjoy. What is, or how do you do heavy sensory deprivation? Is it like, or no, just, just tell me what it is. So heavy sensory deprivation would be literally taking away as many senses as possible. So sight, sound, mobility, um, really just, uh, when, when I do those sorts of scenes, again, for the people that I see, it generally is a, a very, some people call it subspace, but it's a very therapeutic time. It's very um, constrictive and getting them immobile and very quiet and not able to hear or see or move and forcing somebody to stay in that predicament uh, is very powerful. 
also knowing in that situation I could do anything, honestly, that I want. And they can't hear my feet. They don't know if I'm in the room, out of the room. They don't know what implements I may be getting. They don't know what body part I may be going for. Um, so it really is extraordinarily vulnerable for them when you, you can't see or hear or move. Bro, I kind of want my next therapist when I move to Denver to be a dominatrix. Do you have any recs? I want I want a dominatrix with a life coast. I want you, but in Denver. And I don't I don't want to do anything sexual. I just want them to cure my depressions. Let me tell you, I will say that over the years, when you have a good relationship with your client. It, a lot of times, the sexual component really gets downplayed quite a bit. And it becomes much more emotional, much more psychological, much more intimate, but and not nearly as sexual. And I mean, that also has somewhat to do with age, because, you know, obviously my clients are now in the 60s, 70, 80 age range. So just physically, they're not capable, capable of taking the amount of pain or heavy, crazy bondage where they're fighting against it or their bodies are twisted like pretzels. And obviously, uh, just from a blood flow, erection, orgasm issue, it gets a lot harder as, as you get older. So if you maintain focus only on that, you know, you, your time becomes very um, sort of disappointing because they feel they're not able to reach goals that they had done previously. So if you start to shift the focus onto other other ways of, of serving, uh, other ways of being intimate, other ways of um, being vulnerable, then you can really hit the same sort of things that you did when you were younger, just in a less physical way. So one of the ones that I really wanted to know is you keep saying like, oh, somebody who's a novice or somebody a little bit more advanced. Can you tell kind of what level people are at? Uh, I mean, usually, you know, before I see them in person, that's one of the things I discuss at length to see what kind of experiences they've had, what positive experiences they've had, what hasn't worked for them. All of those things are discussed before, or if they haven't done it before. So it, it, it is interesting though, because everybody, even if they've been playing maybe for many, many years, doesn't mean they have a lot of experience because maybe they only do it once every couple of years, whereas maybe someone only has been playing for a year, but has much, much more experience. Um, so yeah, I, I could definitely, I definitely know that just by speaking to them. I do have a question because you started so young as a dominatrix. How have you felt like your profession has shaped your perception of sex and sexuality? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because sometimes I think, I was like, well, what if I wouldn't have done this? Like, where would I be as a 45-year-old woman with my own sort of sexuality or understanding of sexuality? And the one thing I could say is, while I always was a very open person and non-judgmental and came from a background that really fostered that, um, I just... There's no way I would have the understanding of human nature and people. And it's really opened me up and it's really made me even more non-judgmental because the things that I see people are interested in and getting to know them as a person and understanding that just because your kink is A, B, or C, it really reflects zero on other parts of your life. And it was just something I don't think I could really comprehend unless I was doing this professionally. Also, the fact that people who participate in this, myself included, um, a lot of us really are great people, you know, like they, I think even though you might not think it, there's always that little part of yourself because of society that says people who do this are off or, or not, you know, there's something wrong with them. And really, you know, seeing that time and time and time and time and time and time and time again over 25 plus years, um, some of the best people I know are heavy kink players. Um, so that has been just wonderful. I, I would not change my experiences and, um, what I have learned from the people who have come to me for anything in the world. It really is, is amazing. Um, I do feel though, 
it has jaded me to some degree. Um, I've always been one of those people who wanted to do the stuff you're not supposed to do, yada, yada, yada. So trying to find that now at a, a point in my life where I feel I've seen so much and done so much is a little more challenging. So it's forced me to really work on learning to find excitement and joy and happiness in more mundane things and not just sex i'm just talking about life like when your job is going in and you have someone's life pretty much in your hands sometimes with all of the things that i do and ivs and needles and this and that and passing out and you know blah blah blah, blah. um you know just finding excitement in some day-to-day -day stuff is a little hard and i feel that that could really exclude you from relationships and friendships um, because everyone goes to their, you know, nine to five and, you know, their, their biggest excitement in the day is, you know, whatever happens at work, which is usually in comparison to the things that I see every day. Oh, my foot was just in your ass. Hi, how are you doing? You know, it's, it's kind of a little different. Um, so making sure that I keep a good perspective on just uh, maintaining relationships and then finding joy in relationships that are just very normal vanilla type relationships and um on a, on a sexual level it's sort of the same thing but for me my kink profession because of the way that i came up it's very interesting the the younger women that i met, i meet today a lot of them are very kinky sexually and they have a, a, a high level of enjoyment sexually from their participation because of my upbringing in the first 10 years of uh, um what I was doing, the women that were around me really negatively looked upon women who enjoyed sexually what they were doing. Um, it was sort of seen as that you don't do that. Back then also there was a huge difference between escorts and BDSM. You know, and escorts would never stick a finger in a guy's butt or spank anybody. They also wouldn't make out with anybody or do anything without condoms, but that's another story. Um, and women who did BDSM, you know, wouldn't have sex with someone or anything of that nature. So the women that I uh, sort of showed me the, the ropes of this, it was like, you're not allowed to enjoy this. You're this stoic, detached person. So even if I was sexually into what was going on, I really learned a lot of restraint in that area because that's what we did. So it really developed into much more psychological uh, kink and sexual satisfaction and mu much less physical. Like the sex happens for me here and not here. And I think that that definitely had translated to any other sexual relationships that I had because my first sexual experiences were all here. And I still think to that day, that's what I enjoy most. Um, so I think it, it may be a little more challenging for me in the relationships that I've had that were more vanilla because I'm just like, eh, it's boring. <laughs> Sex is boring. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> nah, there's so much more to life. And, uh, you know, so a, a level of being jaded is, is probably part of it. And again, I know a lot of women who have very high sex drives and it really, this just feeds their sex drive. So that may also just be me um, from all the things that I grew up with, you know, growing up, I had serious body image issues because I was so overweight and I didn't have boyfriends and I didn't do any of that stuff when I was younger. So I'm sure that plays a part of it as well. And then you fall into this career where you detach from your sexuality. So in a way it's great because I feel that my sexuality is so much wider and deeper and broader than most people. Um, and it is not at all dependent on the physicality of it. So I feel it sort of offers me so, so, so much more. Um, but I'm sure along the way it, it definitely shifted because the, because of my career. And the great thing about doing this is you learn to accept yourself and realize there's nothing wrong with it. My sexuality does not have to be like anybody else's. You know, if I get off on being in control, you know, if my sexual sadistic side gets to come out during all of these activities and it doesn't involve fucking, 
well, that's totally fine. You know, I don't need to like that. <laughs> that's true. That's an interesting take. Yeah. Um. Well, so we're running out of time. We have another interview, but thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and your stories. You are so charismatic and like fun to talk to. So we really appreciate yeah. you being on the yeah, show. Also, trust me, I don't think teenage boys should be allowed to date. So you didn't miss out on anything by not having boyfriends <laughs> back then. Yeah. I don't think they should be allowed to date either. I know that even at a very young age. Um, I was, was um, and my, my first husband was like 10 years older than me, which was, which was appropriate at the time. Fair enough. Yeah, so didn't miss out on much. <laughs> yeah. I had way more fun at 18. Way more. Way, way more fun. <laughs> Definitely a lot more fun than I had. So not that it's not hard, but... <laughs> Well, if you guys want to follow Mistress Natalie on Instagram, her at is Mistress Natalie at N. Oh wait, Mistress Natalie NYC. That's all yep. one word. Mistress Natalie NYC. <laughs> yeah, so you guys should definitely check her out. You can follow us on Instagram too, Candy Girl Podcast, or Twitter, Candy Girl Pod. And uh, if you have any questions for her or for us or for anyone else who's been on the show, shoot us an email, Candy Girl Podcast at Outlook.com. Again, thank you so much, Mistress Natalie. It was great getting to talk to you. Thank you both so much. This was a pleasure and a joy, and I really appreciate it. And I think it's great that you're, you know, talking about things that not everybody talk about and, and getting it out to the public. So kudos to you, ladies. Thank you. We'll hear from you guys next Friday.